It's been tough for many of us, leaving some feeling discouraged, fearful, and open to temptation. That's why I'm so excited to join you for your annual men's conference on March 13th, 2021, so that we can build each other up in the power of the Holy Spirit to face everything that the world might be throwing at us. It's so important for us to gather as men of God, whether in person or virtually even, to help equip each other for the battles that we face. I'll be focusing in one of my presentations on Isaiah chapter 60 at the very beginning of that chapter. That scripture exhorts us to rise up in splendor for your light has come. Thick clouds covers the people, but over you appears his glory. That's what the scripture says. Get ready brothers to arise and shine, to be encouraged so we can go forward to take our rightful places as men of the most high God. One of the foundational scriptures for us at Hope and Purpose Ministries is Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. Paraphrasing now, it says, uh, for I know well the plans I have for you, and God does have a plan and a purpose for our lives. I plan to bless you, not to curse you. I plan to build you up, not to tear you down. I plan to give you a future full of hope. And when you call out to me, I'll hear you, the Lord says. And when you look for me, I'll let you find me, and I will change your situation, says the Lord. Join me as we call out to the Lord during this time of struggle for many, whether it be for yourself, your family, or the nation as a whole. I believe that the Lord will begin to bless us and give us a breakthrough as he says he will if we turn to him and seek him with all of our hearts. I look forward to being with you virtually on March 13th, 2021 for this men's gathering. May you always live in hope and walk with purpose. God bless you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It is uh, so great to be with you once again with the uh, First Friday Club here in our March session. Uh, how's your Lenten journey going so far? So ladies, uh, for you that are sitting next to your husband or significant other, I would ask you to turn to them and say, you need to attend that conference. So next uh, Saturday, a week from Saturday, March 13th, uh, the men of Cleveland will be gathering for a recorded uh, virtual men's conference. Uh, I would encourage you to go visit our website, cmfneo.com, for all the details. That's Catholic Men's Fellowship, northeastohio.com. Uh, we have some world-class ministry speakers lined up, and Bishop Edward Molesic is actually going to be providing a reflection on the year of St. Joseph. So I'm so excited to be with you today. We uh, have a wonderful uh, speaker who I'm going to turn to in a moment to offer up our opening prayer, uh, Miguel Chavez. But Miguel and I were talking about really some of the exciting things happening in the diocese. And so we're going to really blessed today to have Miguel with us to really share what's happening in his ministry circles uh, and his, the, the uh, fellowship and the ministry discipleship. So before we get into that, I, I just wanted to extend some thanks. So uh, first of all, for uh, Mary and the administrative team for the First Friday Club, they've just been invaluable in helping us put these programs together over the last several months. So Mary, thank you so much. Uh, second of all, I wanted to thank the uh, First Friday Club team uh, as we're mapping out uh, the year ahead. They have really contributed some wonderful ideas and just continuing this, this wonderful tradition that we have going here. And then finally, most of all, to, to you that are joining us, th thanks for staying with us these many months. Uh, we, we certainly would all be like to be doing this in person. But we, we, we really appreciate your staying with us for these virtual sessions. And hopefully one day soon, we will back, be back together in person. So with that, uh, before we formally introduce Mig Miguel, uh, we're going to have Miguel offer up an opening prayer. So Miguel, if you want to uh, make sure you're unmuted there and uh, go right ahead. All right. Good afternoon, my friends. God bless you. God be with you. Let us prepare our hearts as we enter into a spirit of prayer, as we meditate on our role, our responsibility to carry a posture of joy. You may know this. Sing along. Joy is flowing like a river, flowing out of you and me. 
flowing out into the desert, setting all the captives free. Joy is flowing like a river, flowing out of you and me, flowing out into the desert, setting all the captives free. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Lord, you are the source of all joy. Your presence is the wellspring that nourishes our dried and often withered roots. Show us your goodness and love. Animate us with your spirit of life-giving charisma that by our very presence, others may also encounter you. Lord, give us a posture of joy. Fill our hearts to the brim with your wonder and love. Draw us to your captivating imagination, which brought the world into being and inspires us now to dream a new dream, to see a new vision and to be a new people of hope. Lord, give us a posture of joy. A joyful and inviting smile draws us in with excitement and an ennobling desire to be connected. This simple gesture has power to echo the greatest love story of all time, God's love for his beloved, for you and me. Eyes filled with joy peer well beyond any limitation, distortion, or brokenness we experience. Joy-filled eyes gaze in wonder at the immensity of God's love for us and sees in only a glance everything we were made for. Joy fills a glowing face. This is God's simplest and sometimes most impactful example of divine revelation. Lord, give us eyes that see you, ears that hear you, a mouth that proclaims you, hands that serve you, and a heart that loves you. Lord, give us a posture of joy. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Miguel, thank you so much. That, that was wonderful. Uh, at this time, I'm going to uh, turn things over to uh, Maureen Capellas, who will formally introduce our speaker today, Miguel Chavez. Uh, Maureen, when you're finished, you can just pass things right over to uh, Miguel, and I would ask both of you to unmute. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am honored and delighted to introduce our speaker today, who is going to discern with, with us the importance of a posture of joy in evangelization. This is an important and timely topic for us today as we reimagine what it means to be church and to open our doors in a totally new post-pandemic way. Miguel Chavez serves as the director for the Office of Missionary Discipleship with the Catholic Diocese of Cleveland a post he started in January of 2020. He has been active in ministry and education for over 20 years. During his tenure at Walsh University, he worked with young adults in campus ministry and mission Im implementation, facilitating numerous retreats and presentations. He received a grant from the Our Sunday Visitor Institute to develop a leadership in ministry and evangelization program called ELPIS. He created a number of other ministry programs, including From Water to Wine, a young adult ministry outreach. The Diocese of Cleveland is blessed to have Miguel on its leadership team. I met Miguel when just a few weeks into his post, he graciously agreed to present at St. Hilary Parish. And at the time, I could never have imagined how generously and joyfully he would share his multitude of gifts, from his musical talents to his cooking skills to his knowledge and inspiring witness of missionary discipleship. Miguel is an identical twin. He is married to his lovely bride, Kristen, and they have three children, Avery, Tessa, and Isaiah, whom he adores. He loves to sing, fish, and cook. He holds graduate degrees in theology and business. Please join me in welcoming a man who indeed embodies and captivates with a posture of joy, Miguel Chavez. 
Thank you very much, Maureen. And thank you all who are joining, uh, even those who may watch this later. I certainly appreciate your presence and your time. It inspires me and continues to motivate me in so many ways. May God bless our gathering this day and be with us. May the Holy Spirit fill each of our hearts. When I came in to work today, my supervisor, Sister Rita Mary Harwood, uh, she said, you know, today is, is the most commanding day of the year. And I was curious about it at first. And she said, it's March 4th. And if you think of it, that's our role. That's our task as missionary disciples to March 4th, to March 4th, to a new beginning, to March 4th with great enthusiasm, animated by the Holy Spirit to bring about a new reality. This is our joy. So on this March 4th, it's fitting. We are all called as missionary disciples. We must courageously move forward. March 4th, as it is. Uh, thank you, Maureen, for the very kind and lovely introduction. Uh, as she said, uh, family is an very, it's a very important part of my life. Um, my, my, my mother and father reside in Maslin, um, and, and they were awesome parents. They, they really instilled in my brother and I uh, just a love for our faith. Um, I do have a twin brother. His name is PJ. Uh, he's an identical twin. I, I often joke, well, you know, he may be far more talented in some areas. I'm much better looking, but he's been a big part of my life. Uh, Maureen also mentioned my, my wife, Kristen, and my three kids. And this is an important place for me to start because when I think about a posture of joy, when I think about what exemplifies that, I need only look to my family. They teach me so much. I spent the last 20 years working in higher education and this was time for me to also learn and to be nurtured by incredible men and women who took their faith seriously, but was also ready to joyfully go out and to invite in a very hospitable way others uh, onto that journey with them. As Maureen said, uh, I started this post in January of 2020. So this has been a very unique year for all of us but to start a, a new post, a new job, it was very unique to say the least. Um, I was hired by Bishop, uh, now Archbishop Nelson Perez to head this office of missionary discipleship. This office continues the critical work of evangelization and supporting the efforts of our faith communities, but it uses the lens of missionary discipleship to guide our overall vision. Our work is to engender a culture of missionary discipleship throughout the diocese, where people of all ages are moved and nurtured by an encounter of Christ, are then sent out to the peripheries to accompany each other in a walk of faith. The missionary discipleship culture, my friends, it's outward focused. It's concerned heavily about relationships, which flows first from the relationship with Christ, and it is made of people who are always on the move. And that's important in our faith. Our faith always keeps us on the move. While that may be unique this year, as many of us found ourselves confined and isolated, the Holy Spirit was animating us to always be on the move. This vision inspires me in my own faith walk and challenges me to think about ministry and my life a little differently. Today, I've organized a brief presentation and I wanna share my thoughts on three areas. One, I wanna discern a little more on what it means to be a missionary disciple. Two, I want to consider the importance of a posture of joy in this ministry of evangelization. And three, I wanna discern what does that mean for our parishes today? So first, my friends, please allow me to share just a few thoughts on missionary discipleship. Let me set the stage, if you will, on the importance of this posture of joy, which we're all called to carry. Each and every single one of us is called to be a missionary disciple. Pope Francis in his apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Gaudium, he says this, in virtue of their baptism, all members of the people of God have become missionary disciples, called to go out and to baptize, to bring others to Christ. Every Christian is a missionary to the extent that he or she has encountered the love of God in Christ Jesus. He then says this, let us look to those first disciples 
who immediately after encountering the gaze of Jesus went forth to proclaim him joyfully. Notice what it says there. That last piece is very important. The disciples were so moved at this encounter, this gazing on Jesus, that they immediately went out to proclaim the good news with joy. This is at the heart of our own responsibility as missionary disciples. Now, first and foremost, missionary disciples, and this is so important, and this is, this is probably the most important point I want to make today. First and foremost, missionary disciples are in love with Jesus Christ. They're in love with Jesus Christ. Now, think about that for a minute. To be in love involves a complete self-giving, and that self-giving both nurtures and sustains any relationship. When we're in love, we desire to always be in the presence of that individual. And that relationship seems to pour out into all areas of our lives. Think about a leaking pipe, for example. I'm amazed, and I just had, we had to have some plumbing work done in our house. And I'm amazed at how a little bit of water gets everywhere. It permeates everything. It penetrates everything, saturating it, right? Christ's love is the same way. It pours out and it, it saturates whatever it encounters. It's that outpouring love of Christ that is the profound, captivating, and curious posture of joy that moves us as missionary disciples. As missionary disciples, we are called to encounter Christ and nurtured by that life-giving relationship, we're sent out, empowered by the Holy Spirit to walk with others, to accompany others who are restless and searching for more. Have you felt restless over this past year? My goodness, I, I can't think of a time in my life when I felt so restless, ready to move, questioning bigger things in my life, wondering what God had in store. We all feel restless, but our hearts are restless till they find their anchor in God. We learned that from St. Augustine, right? So in many ways, each of us has struggled, has wrestled with this sense of restlessness, but it's in Christ that we find more, right? And this becomes the heart of what we have to be about as missionary disciples. As evangelizers, we have a story to tell. And this story, which is both ancient and new, beautifully fills and fulfills our longing and weary hearts. Jesus Christ died and rose from the dead, redeeming mankind, and he yearns to be in relationship with you and with me. Now, this is not some fleeting surface relationship. No, Christ wants to take on every doubt, every insecurity, every sense of feeling of loneliness, depression, hopelessness, and fear that plagues us. And he wants to break through these deceptive seeds of death to reveal true new life. That is our good news. That is our good news. That news is liberating and it's joy filling. A joy filled heart promulgates through word and action the freedom found only in Christ. And we all long for that freedom. <laughs> Over the past couple months, the sense of confinement, of course, important for our safety, it's felt imprisoning as well, right? But there's a freedom that we can grasp onto knowing that our source, that which fulfills us, is found in Christ. Now, this is our good news. And I believe firmly with all my heart that the world is hungry to hear it, to experience it, to encounter it in Christ Jesus. This is my definition of missionary disciples. Missionary disciples are roving storytellers that captivate hearts to Christ by sharing in word and deed the greatest love story in the history of the world. <laughs> Let me repeat that. As missionary disciples, we are roving storytellers. We're on the move. We've got good news to proclaim and tell that captivate hearts to Christ through the Holy Spirit by sharing in word and deed the greatest love story in the history of the world. It's a love story that involves you and me intricately connected to God as his beloved. As roving storytellers, our narrative ought to captivate those who witness and hear us. 
at its heart, this speaks to the importance of joy in the work of evangelization. Good news, good news is seldom shared without excitement and joy. Next week is my brother's birthday, and I'm going to call him up and say, hey, happy birthday, old man. But I'm going to say it with a sense of excitement and joy and fervor. It's a time to celebrate. When we proclaim the good news, we carry a posture of joy that sometimes speak louder than the words themselves. Missionary disciples must maintain that posture of joy in their words and deeds because that curiously draws others in. We love with joy because he loved us first with great joy. Now, let me move to part two, a posture of joy. What do we mean by that? As I've shared, these COVID months have stilled us in ways we could never imagine. I can't think of a time in my life that I've felt so disconnected. Maybe that resonates with many of you. This feeling of being alone, though, has primed me in my desires to somehow be connected, to be connected to something more, something greater, something fulfilling. Can you think about those moments that you've maybe experienced that? Think about those you've had the chance to speak with in one way or another. There is a deep longing within us to be connected. We're made hardwired that way as human beings. I believe and I know the ground is incredibly fertile now for the joyful work of evangelization. People are searching. The use of technology as well as innovation and creativity has shifted in many ways the landscape of evangelization for many of us. It looks different than it ever has before. We've had to become adept to technological ways of doing things, to uniquely trying to connect with each other. And it's been different. But no matter that difference, the task of joyful missionary disciples remains the same. We walk with and accompany others to nurture a loving relationship with Jesus Christ and proclaim good news through our words and deeds. Now, think for a moment of those people in your life who in their own core exhibit a great sense of joy. Their demeanor is different, isn't it? It's welcoming and inviting. It's ennobling and attractive. It's captivating and curious. In my own personal life, I could think of one man in particular who embodies this kind of joy, and he continues to inspire me in my life. Uh, I worked with him for a little while at Walsh University. His name is Brother Charles Desjolais. He's a brother of Christian instruction, one of the founding brothers, one of the founding, a member of the founding order of the university. But Brother Charles just has a way about him. There is something about his presence where he humbly shares a life-changing joy. And anyone who is around him knows it. There's a way that he just lights up a room, his presence alone. And it might be through a simple smile, but it leaves all of us who encounter him feeling a sense of hospitality, a sense of authenticity, a sense of love. It's easy to recognize in Brother Charles that the joy he carries flows from the love he has with Christ. When others encounter us as missionary disciples, this is how they should describe us, right? I firmly believe that. Now, let me offer a couple more thoughts on a posture of joy. I have three thoughts on a posture of joy. Number one, with a posture of joy, we see things differently. Let me tell you a story. Uh, so I have three young children. Uh, my oldest, Avery, is 11. My daughter is nine. Her name is Tessa. And my youngest is Isaiah. We call him the prophet. He's, all, he's almost three. And one day, I was, it was one evening, I was washing up dishes and I looked over and Isaiah was staring out the window. And I had no idea what he was doing, but he, was, he seemed drawn to something that his eyes had captured. And all of a sudden, he smiled real big and he laughed this really joyful belly laugh. And he ran into the living room and did like a couple circles, danced around and went back to the window and stared again. And then I watched this happen again. A big smile, joyful little belly laugh, dance around the living room and back to the window. I was curious, I went out to the window and I, I looked and there is outside this window, this large overgrown bush. And my eyes were drawn to it thinking, well, I got to do some work there. It's a large overgrown bush. 
But my youngest son caught sight of a red cardinal, a bright red cardinal that sat on this overgrown bush. He was so captivated at the beauty that he was curious about it. And when it moved even just slightly its wings, it drew him joyfully to dance, to laugh. He had captured something that I missed. Oh, what did I see? I saw the big overgrown bush, right? <laughs> As missionary disciples, with a posture of joy, we have to see things differently. We have to see those moments of grace because it's those moments of grace that we're called to cooperate with, that we're called to share and draw others to because it all leads back to an encounter with Christ. Don't miss those glimpses of God's grace. Number two. Missionary disciples animated with a posture of joy should never, never miss an opportunity to share their story and call others to a relationship with Jesus Christ. This involves trusting the movement of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is moving within us, within our communities. We not only must trust the movement of the Spirit within us who are evangelizers, but we must trust the movement of the Spirit in the greater community that we're called to serve. Like magnets that are drawn together, the Holy Spirit brings us together in unique ways at unique times, in God's time. We must be open to that. And when we encounter people wherever it's at, captivated with joy, we must walk and accompany them with love, compassion, empathy, and most importantly, a joyful presence. Presence is everything. It's unique because when you talk about presence in our virtual reality, that looks different, doesn't it? In a year where we can't be present to each other how we once were, we're still called nonetheless to be present, to commit our time to individuals, to listen to them, to be nurtured by them, to walk with them, challenge them, be challenged by them to deepen that relationship, it's absolutely crucial. Now, I believe that if we're going to do this, we have to spend time, we have to be present with Christ. And there's a beautiful prayer, and I like to pray this every single day because it's short and it's simple, and I wanna teach it to you. As missionary disciples, this has to become part of our prayer routine. Are you ready? This is what I do every day. I'll, I'll extend my hands to encounter and receive God's grace. And I say these words, Lord, I'm yours. Lord, I'm yours. There in so, there's a self-giving. There's a recognition that, that what we do all should be oriented to Christ, to the love of God through Christ and the Holy Spirit, that who we are and what we're about belongs to God. And so that takes a lot of pressure off because in the end of the day, this is God's project. We're simply called to cooperate with grace and to be actively engaged within it. And we do so by carrying that love and joy. That's how we are made in God's image and likeness. We reveal the divine presence when we allow the Holy Spirit to move with us and we surrender all those things that keep us from being who we're truly called to be. Lord, I'm yours. Lastly, with, mission, with a posture of joy. As missionary disciples, we need to take seriously the important work of play and imagination. As Christians, we are a people who play. Our, our prayer becomes an expression that, that is like play. Think of it. Play at its heart is a cooperation with God's grace, which I've mentioned right? Our prayer and our worship is filled with lively stories and teachings that, that touch our hearts. The motions of our prayer and worship draw us into a relationship with Christ and encounter and then challenges us outward. It's play. Our service, how we put our faith to action by serving the needs of those who, who are struggling, it's play. The relationships we nurture and, and we ground ourselves in, they form us as men and women of faith. It's play. The way we tell our story, excited, captivating, and curious to others who may hear and witness, it is play. Let me share a quick story about my kids. A couple of summers ago, I remember I, they, they were getting a little antsy and I took them out to a, a local park and they were gonna play on all this park equipment. 
And so I, 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 I sort of joined after the kids got there, they ran up from the parking lot and I joined the, the sort of the crowd of parents who were just spectating, watching anything happen as, as this play out. And it was the most amazing thing because as you witnessed each and every single one of those kids on the playground, they were in the moment. There was a joy that filled them, all of them. They were smiling and they were laughing and shouting back and forth to each other. They were inviting others in. They enjoyed each other's company and they welcomed anybody into their games, right? They were open to whatever the play was. They quickly adapted from one game to another and they invited others to come in. The activity of play for these kids was led by incredible imagination. They weren't afraid to dream, right? And so when they dreamed about something else, they played it and they did it with great joy. Their play was bold, it was loud, it was curious and enticing. And as a parent, I couldn't help but smile watching this play out. I was drawn into it, captivated by it. Now we can take that analogy and put that into our faith life as missionary disciples. Our faith lived out with joy should include everyone. We should enjoy each other's company, be nurtured by each other's company and recognize the presence of Christ in that. We should be open to however the spirit moves us, mindful that, that we are called to be faithful. Lord, I'm yours. We should be a people use, who use our imagination to dream a new dream. Our faith should animate us to be bold, loud, curious, and enticing to all who may encounter us. We see the importance of this. And so with a posture of joy, we see things differently. We can't miss the glimpses of grace that are strewn throughout our lives. As missionary disciples, we should never, never, never miss an opportunity to share the story that we have about the love of Jesus Christ because we live in a world that is longing to hear it. And three, as missionary disciples, my friends, we need to take seriously the important work of play and imagination. The last part of my talk, the connection through the Office of Missionary Discipleship and what this looks like, what it means in a parish. As missionary disciples animated by the Holy Spirit and fueled by our relationship with Christ, we are always on the move like a spreading fire. And let me paint that image for you. A fire, whatever it touches, it consumes as it grows. The love outpoured from the relationship of Christ that we share is like that fire and should consume whatever it touches. Our movement as Christians, ladies and gentlemen, is not about the work of self-preservation. We are to be about the work of mission, not maintenance. We are dreamers who courageously face the world with a playful wonder and imagination. Many of our greatest saints embraced this in their own way as they responded to their own culture and time. As saints in the making, we all are. Can you dare to dream as church and imagine with playful wonder the world transformed in the love of Christ? Because this is our task. This is our moment. The Office of Missionary Discipleship collaborates with and supports faith communities through grassroots efforts and initiatives that focus on relationship development and formation. At its heart, that's where evangelization takes place, in the one-on-one -on -one relationships. It looks small, but its impact is widespread and massive. You know, when you think about Jesus and what he did, Jesus preached to thousands of people. He captivated hearts when he told stories and filled their hearts with hope and wonder of the glory and grace of God. But Jesus spent most of his time with a small group of people. And these people he was present to. He shared all that he was and he instilled within them a spirit of fire that would burn brightly so that they might continue his mission in the Great Commission, we see in the, in the end of the, of the Gospel of Matthew, they would go out and baptize people, making disciples and calling others to this relationship. Our efforts in evangelization involve discerning the movement of the Spirit and calling out all the baptized to use their gifts and talents in ways to support, to nurture, and to build up the church. 
by going out beyond the usual suspects. And every community has the usual suspects. Our work is to be about the people in the peripheries, though, where wandering hearts are looking for more. In many ways, our virtual reality has cast a much wider net to reach some of these folks. We have to take advantage of those opportunities to nurture personal relationships with people, to invite them in and welcome them in, to know that they belong, that they have a sense of purpose and meaning, and that they can find that enrichment in our communities. I had a, a young woman that I, I spoke with a couple of weeks ago, and she's a nurse, a uh, recent nurse, I'd say about two years. And no doubt this past year has really strained her relationships. And I remember she shared with me, she said, I feel so empty. And I don't blame her. What she experienced, what she witnessed, I don't think any of us can put our fingers on unless we've been there, right? Well, on her drive home, she, she was, uh, before she left, she was looking through Facebook and she found this beautiful night prayer by one of our parishes in the Cleveland Diocese. And so she kept it on and she put it through her audio and listened to it on the way home. And she said, she told me this, it was the first time in months that I felt human, that I felt connected to something more, to something greater. Imagine the immense opportunities to reach out to people who are searching for more. Engaging our youth, young adults and families to model for the church the transformative power of a heart on fire and in love with Christ is crucial. <laughs> Our parishes need young people who will invigorate and inspire the good news and word and deed to the church and a community that needs its fires stoked and refueled. Parishes must discern new methods and strategies to not only welcome these pivotal players into the fold, but they must consistently feed them and breathe the oxygen of renewal into their burning hearts. The sacraments, prayer, sacred scripture, our action and service for those who suffer, responding to the immediate needs that we see rise in a community by engaging all people and discernment opportunities with inspired direction. These things will be the wellspring for us as missionary disciples that will ground and anchor us as a community ready to move forward as a church of missionary disciples. Each of you, my friends, is called as a roving storyteller to captivate hearts to Christ by proclaiming in word and deed the greatest love story in the history of the world. Are you ready to joyfully tell our story? Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Amen. Thank you. Miguel, sign me up, brother. Wow, thank you so much for that message that we all need to hear. And I'm not going to let you go this easy. I, I, I've got a couple of questions, but, be, but before we dive into that, I just, you know, if you want a glass of water, take, take a deep breath here. Wow, you, you truly are a roving storyteller. And uh, I, I wanna thank you for your comments. So a, a couple of questions that we were kicking around and I, I think towards the end there that you touched on it, maybe some of the areas of greatest need, but I, I specifically wanted to drill down on the younger people. You know, we, those of us that have families with young adults, we, we, in our workplace, we encounter younger professionals. Uh, you see it at the parish. You know, how can we best address this constituency, the, these younger people, because they, they truly are not right now, but also the future of our church? Absolutely. And thank you. I think that's a great question that we need to wrestle with day in and day out, Bill. Here's what I'll say. And the short of it is we have to be willing, and it seems almost too simple to invite people to invite these families in. You know, it's so funny. I mentioned that there's a, we all have an innate desire to, uh, a desire to belong to something. Well, young adults, and I can speak as a father with young kids and a family, you know, I, I feel like this in a sense of restlessness, I, I've got a lot to give, right, into a faith community, but we've been confined. And so th there's this, we've all been primed in some ways. Parishes need to somehow engage, and here's how we do it 
our parishioners are the perfect people to do this. As missionary disciples, we need to go out and to invite young people, not just to come to Mass, but say, hey, we have this event. They need some help. Can you bring the family here? Let's connect some of these young people, young families with other people. Let's develop and build these relationships. Let me give you an example, uh, and, and I, I think it's great. Um, I, this weekend, we're gearing up, and this is very exciting for my whole family. Our Lady of Victory is having a spaghetti dinner following Mass at 11. It's a pickup. It's carryout, you know. Well, our family is talking about it with great excitement. So uh, Father Matus, we're, we're really geared up for this event, right? And, you know, an event like this, it's, it's, a, it's a great way to connect with, with young people who, who one, want to be part of a community. But we have to be bold enough to ask, hey, can you do this? And that's the thing. Our young people, I mean, all of us as missionary disciples, but our young people have so much to give. And so sometimes that requires a new structure. We can't have the same people doing everything. And we tend to fall into that. That's maintenance. But the, the mentality of mission is that we reach out creatively to some people and we engage them on a personal level. Hey, we need you. Hey, you should be a part of this. Come and join me. And let's connect and build a, a, a standing relationship. It's not just a, hey, are you interested in volunteering? No, we should be very specific with how we're engaging. With a young family, right, for our faith communities, what are we offering to everybody? You know, for me, and again, it sort of spans the scope. I have an 11-year-old, I have a nine-year-old, and then almost a three-year-old. Well, as parents, you know, we love to, to, to you know, engage as within our faith community, but boy, it's difficult sometimes when we wonder, well, we know the older kids can do this, but what are we going to do with Isaiah? And you know, we have to be mindful of those things. I am taken at the, the gifts that young people bring and the enthusiasm. But sometimes they're bashful to be involved unless they're asked. Uh, let me give you an example. When I worked at, at Walsh, uh, when I was at Walsh, there was one young woman who was just actively engaged in our ministry. And a couple years later, after she graduated, I connected with her and I said, well, how are things going? And she said, oh, good. You know, she was kind of situating herself in her work. And I said, so what church are you going to? And she couldn't answer because she said, well, essentially she church hops and it's by convenience. It sort of depends on what her schedule's like. And I said, well, have you connected with the community? No, it's an in and out kind of a thing. And and while she doesn't make much of an effort to connect, the parish doesn't either, or any of the parishes she's belonged to. There's a gap there that we need to bridge. Now, imagine if our communities had a killer hospitality, right? I mean, over the top. And so a person, a family couldn't, couldn't be part of or, or attend or, or somehow virtually visit or be with a faith community without someone reaching out and saying, hey, I don't recognize you. My name is so-and-so, and then start a relationship. That's what we need because the youth is there. The, the, I'll be honest, the future of our church with our youth and young people, ridiculously hopeful, ridiculously hopeful. I think we have to be courageous enough and creative enough to ask and say, hey, I think you need to be a part of this. <laughs> well, come, will you come and join me? Well and said, well said, thank you. Uh, one more. Uh, and, and again, this, th this comes up a lot. So I, I know there is somebody watching today mm -hmm. that in their mind, they're thinking, I, I want to get involved. I, I'm not quite sure how to do it. Uh, I'm a little apprehensive. I've never really been involved in my parish or the church before. What specifically could you say to that person to get them what what's the next step? How how can they get involved in what you're doing or at the parish? Give give us some thoughts on that. Thank you. So I would say first and foremost, start with the parish, right? Our role on the diocesan level, diocesan level, we support our parishes in any way we can. And while there are initiatives and endeavors, where the rubber hits the road is going to be our parishes. So here's what we do. You know, if there's a yearning in your heart, and actually our virtual world has, I think, made build some great bridges for this. But it's easy to scroll down, for example, in social media and see a, a video posted or a live stream prayer. There, that is such a, a unique way to connect with a faith community. 
And then what I tend to do, so I, I've got my, a, a handful of my parishes that I follow because of their prayer experiences and opportunities. And I'll follow them. And oftentimes I, I'll see there's typically the, there are uh, common people that respond and make comments. I would reach out if I was somebody saying, hey, I want to be more involved. And, and I'm, I'm, I feel pulled to what you're doing. I try to reach out with them first off. As the church too, I think on, on the parish end, we have to be mindful. And this is where we can't be navel gazing, wondering uh, how we're going to focus on ourselves. We have to be looking outwards. We have to be captivated by the people that we don't know <laughs> and, and essentially go out and, and try to meet them. Now, for that person whose heart's burning, and again, it could be for, like I mentioned, this, this woman who was a nurse, who's a nurse, who on her way home, listened through the audio of night prayer, you know, well, you know, it could end right there and say, well, that was nice that night, right? But I, I followed up with her. I had, you know, when I checked in, I said, so how you doing? She said, well, I had this, and she told me her story and said, it was the first time I felt human. Well, we can't leave it at that. Then we say, well, hey, let's connect you better. Let's see who we can connect you with. But that's the thing. I, I, and I, especially with young people, I just, there's this, this motivation, this drive to move forward, but it, it all orbits on the relationship. I would say practically to begin with, and again, there a lot of uh, most parishes are opening and functioning, right, to some degree, and you could certainly show up on a Sunday and, and it would be uniquely structured and set up, but use social media, use this virtual platform that many parishes have become completely adept to, to at least explore, see what you're drawn to, pray with this community, and then reach out to some of those key pivotal players it's a great way to connect. And let me tell you, when I've done that, I've been welcomed with open arms, right? So it's, it's going to be a give and take. And as we dream about whatever the new new or the new normal is going to look like in our church, we have to be mindful and trust the Holy Spirit, but we can only do so if our gaze is focused outward. Thank you again, Miguel. Uh, my wife, Millie, was... Uh commenting while you were talking there she says it's all about the encounter yeah amen. amen so let us in the as we continue in this lenten season let's let's reflect inward but to your words of encouragement let's look outward yes at those around us in the community in our parishes before i uh, turn things over to uh bishop roger for the closing prayer uh, Maureen, I'll ask you to come back on if you're still there. Uh, I, I just a uh, couple of housekeeping items, but before I do that, you know, many are committed to the Sacred Heart of Jesus Novena. Uh, they're attending uh, every uh, the Mass on every first Friday, experiencing the Sacrament of the Eucharist. Jesus specifically left Margaret, St. Margaret Mary 12 promises, and I was looking at these, and this one really stood out, Miguel, because I think it really touches on a, a lot of what you're talking about. So here, here's one of those promises. I, Jesus, will pour abundant blessings upon all of your undertakings, and I know that Jesus is going to prosper your undertakings and our undertakings here in the Diocese of Cleveland and Northeast Ohio. So next month, uh, we are going to be joined by uh, Dr. Michael Pressamone, president of the, the Notre Dame College here locally. We're really excited about this talk. Uh, now, next month, we're moving it back a week to April 8th, because that first week of April, of course, is Holy Week. So the next uh, first Friday gathering will be Thursday, April 8th. Uh, at the beginning, we're also going to be joined uh, by Bernadette from uh, AM 1260, The Rock Radio, just to provide an update what's going on with Catholic Radio in our community. So with that, uh, thank you, Miguel. Maureen, thank you for the uh, introduction to Miguel. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Bishop Roger for our closing prayer today. And I want to thank you too, Miguel, because you certainly show in your in your action and your whole personality what a uh, what a, a real evangelist, you know, an active evangelist is really like. Because I'll tell you, 
you know, for 40 years now, I've been going, uh, doing confirmations as an abbot and as a bishop, going from parish to parish. And it's just amazing. Uh, the, the whole atmosphere of a parish that has a lot of joy in it is so welcoming and so, so exciting. But the problem I'm, I'm facing, you know, more and more as it goes on is that these young people are coming to confirmations thinking that this is just something to do. And they don't look at it as an experience with Christ, an experience of receiving the spirit of Pentecost for them. And I, you know, and I, I really get surprised sometimes when I, when I go in and a pastor says, can you say something to these kids about Sunday mass? Because I, I haven't seen half of these kids ever, you know? And so it's, it's one of those things. Well, the parents, I think, really are the ones that really have to show what a what a uh, the evangelist is like that you are speaking about today. You know, the really a really a missionary evangelist. And so I the one I the one I like to reflect that is always Mother Teresa because she always said that a smile a smile is a, is a gift of yourself as a gift of yourself. So whatever you do, go in with it. And I think that's the way all our martyrs went into their into their martyrdom. They went in joyfully because they knew what the experience was going to be. But as we close now, I just want to remind everybody that this is the year of St. Joseph, uh, ded dedicated by Pope Francis as the year dedicated to uh, St. Joseph. And uh, the, uh, the Holy See has uh, granted a plenary indulgence to uh, Catholics who recite any approved uh, prayer or act of piety in honor of St. Joseph, and especially on March 19th, this special feast day. And so I'd like to close today with the prayer to St. Joseph. Well, St. Joseph, through your love of Jesus Christ and for the glory of his name, hear our prayers and ask God to grant our petitions. Glorious St. Joseph, faithful follower of Jesus Christ, to you do we come to ask your powerful intercession in obtaining from the merciful heart of Jesus all the helps and graces that we need for our spiritual and temporal welfare and the grace of a happy death. Watchful guardian of the Holy Family, ward off from us every worry and difficulty. As you rescued the child Jesus, so now protect us. Shield us by your constant care so that we may be able to live with peace of mind and obtain eternal happiness. And so to you all who are attending today, remember, say a prayer in honor of St. Joseph and if you're especially remind those who are homebound, those who may be in hospitals or those who are in nursing homes, remind them that everyone has the opportunity to get this plenary indulgence by saying a, an active prayer in honor of St. Joseph. And then with the, with, the, with the promise that someday, somewhere, you'll be able to fulfill the obligation of, of a communion and, and confession. And so thank you, Miguel, for your inspiration. And thank you, Maureen, for your introduction. And Bill, thank you again for the wonderful leadership you give to the First Friday Club. And with that, let me, let me end with a blessing. The Lord be with you. And may with Almighty God spirit. bless you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God is good. All, all the, the time. time. All the time. God is God good. Is good. God, bless God bless you all. Take care now. See you next month, everyone.